Good morning, Lockwood Church. Happy Easter. I'm Kevin Looper. I'm the youth pastor here at Lockwood Church, and we are delighted that you've chosen to worship with us on this blessed day. For centuries, Christians have traditionally greeted one another on Easter morning by saying to one another, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Really, it's not just a greeting. It's a declaration of faith that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead 2,000 years ago in a statement of our hope in our own resurrection when Jesus returns. So just because we're apart this year and we're in our separate homes does not mean that this tradition should cease. When I say Christ is risen, I want you to say aloud from your living room chair, Christ is risen indeed. And then together we will say hallelujah. Okay, are you ready? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's say it again. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Today is Easter. And because of what happened on the first Easter, nothing can steal our joy now, no matter how dark or difficult things are in the world. So let's sing along with the songs at home or meditate on the lyrics and let's be glad. Join us in prayer and listen for God's voice when the word is being preached. And after the service, there will be prayer helpers available to pray with you. If you have a prayer need, just just call us at the office at 517-279-7536. And we'll answer and we'll pray with you. We'll, We'll keep your requests confidential. Remember, this week, to find ways to serve your neighbors and your church family. Call or text them check on the elderly, pick up meds and groceries for those who can't do it themselves. Let's serve God well by loving each other. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Now let's worship the risen Christ. Christ the Lord has risen today. 
rejoice in your goodness. We rejoice in your hope. You loved us. You saved us. You were raised from the dead, as Kevin said. Your resurrection is a promise of our resurrection, and we rejoice in you, Lord. Work in us. Move us. Lift us. And we will exalt your name forever. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue worshiping. Yeah. 
the time we usually worship God with tithes and offerings. I want you to know that Lockwood people have given generously, which glorifies God and witnesses to our confidence in him. If you would like to give, you can do so by going to www.lockwoodchurch.org, click the Give button and follow the prompts, or you can just send your offerings to Lockwood Church at 202 East Lockwood Road, Coldwater, Michigan, 49036. I heard today that there are 800,000 people in our state who've been laid off. We know this is a scary time financially, and we don't want you to give us money that God wants you to use for yourself or your family, or if you're not part of Lockwood, to your church family. If you can't give money to the Lord right now, that's okay. The important thing is that you find other ways to give yourself to him in worship. I'm going to invite you to join me as we pray together. Almighty God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you overcame death and freed us from the grip of sin. On this day, we pray that you will overcome the virus that has us in its grip. But Lord, live or die, we know the great battle has already been won by your Son. Grant that we who celebrate his resurrection today may be raised with him and walk in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today, Paul's great chapter on the resurrection. I want to read for us from verses 20 through verse 26. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. In the four gospel accounts of the life and death of Jesus, and this surprised me very much when I first realized it, and it surprises me still. No one ever uses the word resurrection to describe Jesus' return from death. Neither the gospel writers nor the people whose conversations they reported. They talk about how Jesus rose from the dead, but they never use the one word you would expect them to use, resurrection. It's almost as if they were avoiding it. That ought to raise a question to our minds. Why didn't they use the word resurrection? The answer, I think, comes in two parts, the first of which is very straightforward. The gospel writers did not use the word resurrection because the men and women whose story they were telling didn't use that word. The fact that the writers refrain from using what is arguably the most important word in the vocabulary of the early church speaks volumes about their intention to faithfully record what actually happened. Some modern scholars think that everything theological in the Gospels, especially everything that points to the deity of Jesus and his status as the Messiah, was invented by the church at a later date and written into the Gospels as an act of historical revisionism. These scholars believe that the healing miracles, the transfiguration, and especially the resurrection never happened. They think the church fabricated them as a way of elevating Jesus' status 
and validating their faith. Yet here we have the most important thing the climax of all four Gospels, and the core tenet of the Christian faith, and none of the writers even once give in to the temptation to describe it as resurrection. This is an overlooked and remarkably important evidence for biblical authenticity. Now that brings us to the second part of the question. Why didn't the people in the story Peter, John, the apostles, the women disciples, why didn't they refer to Jesus' return from the dead as resurrection? The doctrine of resurrection was profoundly important to most first century Jews. It was a belief for which they were willing to fight. So why didn't Jesus' apostles, the women disciples, or even after the fact, the fidgety chief priests ever use that word? I think the answer is once again straightforward, though it might surprise us. In the immediate aftermath of Jesus' return from the dead, the disciples didn't realize he had been resurrected. Now, they did believe Jesus rose from the dead. The evidence overwhelmingly supports that conclusion. They did not, as some have suggested, think that Jesus lived on in spirit or as a life force or as a powerful memory, as people do when they point to their hearts and say of a deceased spouse, he's still with me and always will be right here. No, the disciples believed that Jesus died, that he was stone cold dead, dead as a doornail, dead and buried. And they believed that after three days, he came back to life, that he was alive again, walking, talking, eating, drinking, alive. But during those first days, it didn't occur to them that Jesus had been resurrected. That may sound like a contradiction to you. It's not. The disciples had seen three other people that we know of raised back to life after they died. The daughter of Jairus, the young man living and dying in Nain, and most spectacularly, their good friend Lazarus. These people had been dead, stone cold, dead as a doornail, dead, and somehow Jesus brought them back to life. But the disciples didn't think that any of these people had been resurrected. The idea never occurred to them and it wouldn't occur to them. When they heard that Jesus was alive and then saw him for themselves after having seen him horribly killed, they believed that their master had risen from the dead and they were overjoyed, but that did not signify to them that he had been resurrected. In their minds and in the minds of their contemporaries, resurrection was a different thing altogether. It didn't happen here or there with this person or that person. When it happened, it would happen to everyone in the world. And that would be on the last day. Resurrection was the inaugurating event of the age to come. So even though Jesus rose from the dead and his friends knew it, they didn't make the connection between his rising and the resurrection. In their minds, when the resurrection happened, everyone who had ever died would be raised from the dead, the righteous to eternal life and the unrighteous to eternal death. It took time and instruction, most importantly from Jesus himself, for the enormity of what had happened in that garden tomb to sink in. Jesus had not only come back to life after being dead, as remarkable as that was, death had been overcome and the resurrection, the coming to life of everyone who had ever lived, had begun. By the time we come to the early chapters of the book of Acts, Jesus' followers are using the word resurrection right and left. What changed? 
over the 40-day period following the Passion, Jesus repeatedly met with the disciples and explained to them from Scripture what had happened and what it meant. In Luke's words, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. By the time the events in Acts take place, beginning less than a month and a half later, we find the disciples proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They now understood that the resurrection, the coming to life of everyone who had ever died, had commenced, that brought them to the remarkable conclusion, this astounding, that the last days had begun and the renewal of all things, to use Jesus' own words, was underway. Easter celebrations frequently focus on the fact that we will continue to live after we die. As true as that is, it's important to realize that most people believed that before Jesus rose from the dead. They believed that humans continue to exist in some form as ghosts or spirits or some amalgamation of life forces after they die. The resurrection of Jesus signaled something more radical and far-reaching than that. No one has ever explained the implications of Jesus' rising more thoroughly than the Apostle Paul. When he first heard Jesus was alive, he didn't believe a word of it. Today, we assume that people in the first century were gullible and would believe anything. That's rubbish. They were no more likely to believe that a man three days dead would return to life than we are. Paul never doubted it was a hoax until he saw the resurrected Jesus for himself, and that changed everything. From, from that time on, Paul could not stop talking and writing about the resurrection. In his biblical letters, Paul uses the noun resurrection approximately four times as often as he uses the noun for forgiveness. The verbs related to resurrection and forgiveness are even more out of balance. It is impossible to overstate the importance of the resurrection for Paul. As far as he was concerned, there is no faith in Jesus apart from belief in the resurrection. Paul's most comprehensive explanation of resurrection comes in 1 Corinthians 15. The entire letter was written around the idea, and this is important, that God is restoring all things, and the resurrection is central to his plan. And when I say resurrection, I am referring to the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of all the rest of us. In Paul's mind and in the minds of the early Christians, the two cannot be separated. His resurrection is the guarantee of ours, and ours is the outcome and achievement of his. The bond between them is unbreakable. Yet some people in Corinth were trying to break that bond. They couldn't see how sophisticated individuals in this day and age could believe in the resurrection. Yes, they believed God raised Jesus from the dead, but they denied that the rest of us would be so raised. See, they believed that death unchains people from their weak and corrupt bodies and releases their spirits into the eternal world. To them, the idea that the spirit would be reunited to the body was repulsive. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15. The central question in this passage comes in verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? These educated Corinthians were affirming that Jesus had been raised, but denying the resurrection of the rest of us. In this chapter, Paul begins with the question of whether the dead are raised. He then moves to the question of when the dead are raised, and finally to the question of how the dead are raised. It's, it is a brilliantly organized passage. We don't have time to look at all of it, 
So we'll focus on the relationship between the miracle of Christ's rising and our own resurrection. Now remember, some of the Corinthians denied there is a relationship between the two. Paul insists that there is. He carefully avoids throughout this chapter speaking about Jesus' resurrection and our resurrection as if they were two different things. Jesus' resurrection is part of the resurrection, or it might be more accurate to say that the resurrection flows out of Jesus' resurrection. The two cannot be disconnected. There is one resurrection, but it happens in two phases. Christ's resurrection is the first stone in an avalanche. Why make such a fuss about this? Because Paul understands that the resurrection is about more than a spirit being reunited to a body following death. That is far too individualistic a way of looking at it. Resurrection is the pivotal event in God's plan to make all things new. Resurrection inaugurates the last days, initiates the great renewal, and promises the glories of the kingdom of God. Resurrection is the threshold into the age to come. Now, most Jews already believed that. What they didn't know was that the resurrection had already begun in Jesus. That was the astounding good news the Christians had to tell. It wasn't just that people go on living after they die. Everybody already knew that. It was that the new age had arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. That's why, verse 20, Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or have died. In the first century, everyone understood the image of first fruits. Each year, at the very beginning of the wheat harvest, the Israelites sent their first ripe wheat as an offering to the Lord's temple. Seven weeks after that, they went to Jerusalem to celebrate the completed harvest. Just as the first fruits announced the harvest had begun and promised more to follow, Jesus' rising announced that the resurrection had begun and promised more to follow. We live in the period between first fruits and the harvest. Now remember that behind this passage stands the idea that God is restoring creation. So there are allusions to the first creation, uh, recounted in Genesis 1 and 2, everywhere in this chapter. That is intentional. There are seeds and plants, like Genesis 1. There are men and animals, birds and fish. There is sun and moon and the stars. And in case we still miss it, Adam himself shows up. Paul is thinking about creation and recreation. The first creation floundered upon Adam's rebellion and his dying. The new creation was established on Jesus' obedience and is ready to rise. Look at verses 21 and 22. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But, verse 23, each in his own turn. Here's where the Jesus followers' understanding of the resurrection goes beyond the ancient Jewish understanding. It didn't change it. Paul's view is still thoroughly Jewish. But it added to it. It clarified it. The additional insight was this. There is an order to the resurrection. It happens in phases. That's the thing that Paul and his colleagues had not previously understood. When he did, it changed everything. And it should change everything for us, too. Christ's resurrection was not simply proof of 
that people continue to live in some form after they die. It's not just proof that death has been defeated, though it is that. It is proof that the new age has dawned, that the ancient promises made by God, the promises of a kingdom, of restoration, and of renewal were being fulfilled. It was proof to the disciples, as Chesterton once put it, that the world had died in the night and that what they were looking at was the first day of a new creation. You see, Judaism divided time into two ages, the present age and the age to come. The present age is an age of injustice and conflict. Paul referred to it elsewhere as the present evil age. The age to come, on the other hand, will be the time of God's undisputed rule, characterized by peace and justice, a time of prosperity, reconciliation, and joy. And everyone knew the line between this present age and the age to come was the resurrection. Now, keep with me here. Here is Paul telling us that the resurrection has already begun. The claim is staggering. The resurrection began on a spring morning, somewhere around 30 AD, in a Jerusalem garden when Jesus came out of the tomb. And it will conclude when Jesus comes back from heaven. But if that's true, what happens to the age to come? That is a profoundly important question. And no one contemplated it more deeply than Paul himself. He believed that the new age had already dawned and that everyone who confesses Jesus as Lord has already become a part of the new creation. So he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And the Greek in that passage is very staccato. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. It's as if Paul's saying, oh, new creation, new creation. Every believer in Jesus is a sign of new creation. The new age had dawned, but the old age would not conclude until the completion of the second phase of the resurrection when the Messiah returns. See, the moon is still out, but the sun has already risen. We live in the overlap period between the arrival of the new age and the termination of the old. We frequently think that the resurrection is proof that we'll go to heaven when we die. Paul thought that the resurrection is proof that God's kingdom has come to earth while we live. The new age has dawned, or to be more precise, the new age is dawning. In the overlap time, we still have the sorrows, sins, and corruption of the present age. But we can already tap into the joy and peace and freedom of the age to come. The winds of that age are blowing across the borders of time, and we can lean into them. We can know the power of the resurrection as Paul puts it, the remarkable power to live the future in the present. It's in this overlap period that we learn to live in the newness of life. There are battles to be fought and won during the overlap. There is a way of life to be learned. There is work to be done. So Paul says in the last verse of this chapter, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Easter, the resurrection, means so much more than life after death. It means that we can live a different kind of life before we die as we draw on the resources of the age to come. Most people live out of the past. For good or ill, they are molded and often shackled by their former experiences. But those who have faith in Jesus 
can break the mold by learning how to live out of the future. They can learn to tap into the age to come and so live in hope. They are formed by the future in ways that people who are shaped only by the past don't experience. They live, as Paul put it, in the power of the resurrection. And that sets them free to become all that God intends them to be. If you want that kind of life, a future-oriented, God-empowered, old habit-breaking, hope-producing life, there's one place to find it. In a faith connection to the resurrected one, Jesus. If you've already established a faith connection to the living one, that kind of life is waiting for you and for us. Let's determine to learn to live it. All right, now let's pray. Our small minds, oh God, can't take it all in. We just get little pieces at a time. And they're like pieces of a puzzle that we haven't put together. But even so, we see the glories of your kingdom and the brilliance of your wisdom and the love of your heart shining through. We thank you for Jesus, who has conquered death and brought the age to come to our doorstep. By your grace, grant us faith to cross the threshold. And we ask for this in the name of the risen one, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And now there are prayer helpers who are ready to pray with you. So if you have a prayer need, just call us here at 517-279-7536. If you have any trouble getting through, you can leave a message or just try calling back. We'll stay until the phones stop ringing. And I encourage you to go to lockwoodchurch.org and click on the Go Deep site. You'll find a, a set of questions for 1 Corinthians 15 to help you understand this passage more clearly and apply it to your life. And now, I invite you who are here in the room to stand with me, and we're going to conclude this service the same way we began it. I will say to you, Christ is risen. You'll reply to me, Christ is risen indeed. And then together we'll say, Alleluia. Let's do this at home as well. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. God bless you and happy Easter.